So the first thing I want to start is with a question like, did you know that a typical offshore intervention vessel launches into the atmosphere about 10 tons of CO2 every year? Yeah, so anyone here could guess? That's, that's a lot of waste. Uh, what if I tell you that over 90% of that waste can be, can be avoided? That'd be cool, yeah? All right, so that's what I'm gonna be talking here today. Um, we'll, go over, we'll go over a typical case of uh, ROV intervention on an ROV intervention vessel. Then we're gonna go over a little bit about the waste involved with it. We're gonna talk about the process to eliminate the waste and then what new technologies are available today. The first thing I want to do is to ask you to pay attention to this picture. Uh, it's very special. You may not be able to see it yet, but I'm hoping that you'll be able to see what's special about these uh, within the next 20 minutes or so. So just pay attention to it. All good? Yeah? Okay. All right. So uh, here's a picture of one of the most modern construction vessels available out there. You know, and this type of vessel, they still have about 20,000 horsepower to keep this machine going. That's the equivalent to 100, between 100 and 200 cars, you know, depending on which car you drive. But it's quite a, quite a big machine. You know? And for one of those uh, 20,000 horsepower, you know, most of it's waste, and we're gonna take a look at that in a, in a minute. These vessels, they are normally equipped with one or two ROVs on board. So you can see the ROV there in the highlight. Uh, the blue thing there is a launching system, and the ROV is the yellow piece there, white, inside the cage. Uh, some more detail. This is a launching system of a typical ROV. This one has a topside uh, TMS, or a tether management system. And what that does, you know, that uh, silver piece on top of the ROV it has the cable that helps the ROV to explore some sea and still get electricity through it and send back communications uh, topside. So different configuration, the previous picture, the ROV was inside a cage. On this one, the ROV has a top head TMS. Uh, the ROVs, they do work subsea. Most of the work is uh, in deep water, and in shallow water, they're a good alternative to diving, right? I hope my time is still okay. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Right, so you can see this, this specific machine here is one of the latest technology, it has about 250 horsepower, and is operating doing some sub intervention on a Christmas tree. So there's a reason I've been telling you about how much horsepower a vessel has, and how much horsepower an ROV needs, right? So pretty much you have the vessel top side that's trying to stay floating, and is burning fuel, burning a lot of diesel and uh, generating 10 ton of uh, CO2 every year, and just trying to sit there. And there's not much it is doing. It's just really sitting there. As it sits there, it's just generating waste, right? So you have the waste related to the burning diesel. You have waste related to the people that are sitting there doing the work. They may not feel as waste because you know, they are busy in that vessel doing general activities, but most of that is really not required for that subsea intervention. You're also burning money. So you burn quite a significant amount of money with uh, logistics to keep that people offshore. Sometimes you've got to send a helicopter out there. You know, you've got to send boats there to provide these guys with food to stay there on shore, on site for several weeks, sometimes a couple months. And all, that is, uh, all that's doing is really waste. So we're going to get into the, the process, right? Uh, what's really the process to make this operation more efficient, you know, with less uh, pollution, with less waste? Most of the ship companies, the way they go is to get into more efficient motors, right? So I have some friends here from GE, they're probably talking you know, with the vessel company saying they have super modern motors that don't need as much fuel, that don't uh, generate as much pollution. But the best process really to cut that pollution down is just eliminate the vessel. It's that simple, right? It's not complicated. You take the vessel away off the picture, now you have 100, 150 to 250 horsepower machine working subsea, and all that pollution goes away. About 40 people that are working on the vessel, they all go away. Uh, they're not gonna be very excited about it. The vessel companies are not very excited about this technology too. The one I work for is split, because this is a necessary evolution, right? We gotta get there, we gotta be more efficient on doing work underwater. 
Uh, to enable that, we need a communication buoy, right? Oh, it's communicating now. And uh, in addition to that, we also need a battery pack that uh, has uh, the tether management system we've seen before integrated to it. So this system is pretty much uh, a group of batteries that we've learned you know, from automotive industry on how to use it, how to make it effective. We've used our expertise to make it work subsea. And then we integrate the two into existing equipment. So I'm going to show, this is on YouTube, so it may take a second to load. I'm going to show the main components involved in this, uh, this system. Right? So we still have the, your typical uh, vessel there, but instead of this vessel just sit on that location, what it's going to do is just, just going to deploy the ROV system. Once this package is in the water, you can see that flotation buoy uh, stands up and the rest of the package is uh, deployed subsea. We're using vessel crane here, so we're still creating some pollution from the vessel use, but we're talking about just a few hours of work versus you know, a vessel staying on site for several weeks. To get subsea, there's a, a couple of things that the ROV gotta do to make sure it's working just fine. Uh, you can see open mud mat, disconnecting that cable from that, ROV, from that vessel, you know, releasing it upside. And now the ROV is free to the work subsea, working our asset while the vessel just goes away, do something else, right? Trying to be more productive, can be employed in other, other applications. Um, with our existing design, you know, this system can stay subsea for, you know, between four and eight weeks. So think about, you know, eliminating our vessel from site for six weeks. You now you're talking probably about between 50 and $100,000 per day of savings plus all the, the pollution associated to it just goes away. Once you run out of batteries, you know you can recharge them subsea, but you need a vessel to stay on top while doing that. The most effective way is really just to get there, get that package out of the water, you know, replace it with a second system that may be full of uh, uh, energy in the batteries, or just go back to shore, put it there, plug to the wall, let it recharge, and then you'll come back to do some more work. So now that I gave you uh, a lot of details about this process, uh, can you see something special with, uh, with this picture? Yeah? All right, yeah, you guys are good. So there you go. Yeah, you can see the flotation buoy. Uh, so this communication buoy is there uh, today uh, operating for Equinor in the North Sea. Here you can see an actual picture that looks quite like the animation. Thinking that the animation was developed during the concept phase, I think this is pretty cool to see this in real life. You still need some people, so, but now these people can work from the offices, you know, maybe here in Lisboa or maybe you know, in uh, Oslo somewhere or in Houston. Potentially in the future they can do this work from home, but today this work is being done from the office in Stavanger. All the communication is uh, 4G, so pretty much a cell phone. Communication, that works, that works really well. We're looking to more remote areas where you need satellite communication. That's two works, it's just more expensive than, than 4G. Now, this is uh, today, right? So this is uh, new technology. This is the first intervention that has ever been made uh, di uh, vessel-less. So without a, without a vessel, there was ROV work happening, taking place, completely disconnected from the top side, which is you know, very, very interesting. But you still need a lot of uh, human interface. Uh, what we're working now is, the, what's, the, what's next? What's the future here? The future is really to build some uh, intelligence into these robots so they can do this work subsea. So we'll go to another video on YouTube. I think, oop, too far. I think I need Patricia to help me with this. You got it? Just give it a second. Patrice will try to bring it up. And anyway, I can start to give you some more details about what you're going to see. Uh, the Brownfield solution is the ERV that you guys saw in a minute, right? But on new developments, ideally you design subsea feature, features that allow this, this autonomous system to just live underwater the water for longer, right? So you don't need to go there with a vessel every six weeks to, to get it done. Uh, these charging stations, they can be developed by the ROV suppliers, just like us, or maybe by the OEM. So uh, people that are making your trees, your manifolds, they can probably also provide with a uh, charging station. And the way we're going with technology, obrigado. 
the way we're going with technology is to try to have these uh, uh, charging stations the more uh, interchangeable possible. So you don't need to stick to our technology. You, know, you can also use our competitors, but at least from the field layout phase, you're already thinking about having a subsea autonomous system there. Uh, we call this system freedom, because that's what it means, right? So it's freedom from the vessel, it's really freedom from most of the, the human interaction. And it has uh, capabilities that are similar to an AUV. So it can go out by itself, find a pipeline, do inspection, can find our subsea equipment and do some basic intervention. And at the same time, it has an ROV feature, so it can stay in position, it can go there and check, you know, for uh, cathodic protection and things uh, like that. Uh, at this stage, you see the ROV just, you know, sense that it's running out of power, so it's time to look for the next charging station. So found one nearby, it's just gonna dock there and, and recharge. Uh, there are some safety features that prevent this vehicle from getting lost, you know, so it's either going to go subsea and tell you where it is, or it's going to go topside so a vessel can rescue, depending on the, the logic there. But the inter interesting bit is if you still need to do more complex work that the ROV doesn't know how to do, you can still control that remotely from your office. So that communication buoy is going to work just like on the other ROV you saw, but now there's a cable connecting this vehicle to the station and topside. And someone in the office can do uh, control the functions, go there and open a valve, or maybe just watch real-time uh, video coming from that, that operation. I will be back to the station, and that's it. So that's all I have. Uh, if you have more questions, please come see me in the, in the break, and I'd love to talk more about it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Now time for questions from you, please. Uh, Robert Xavier, Subsea 7, Simon, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is about the market itself, the market environment for this such type of application. How do you see competition and the appetite for besides Equinor, of course, the appetite for to get this type of a, um, resource. Yeah, it's uh, interesting because, you know, new technologies doesn't mean cheaper on day one, right? It's probably going to have a reduced cost over time. Uh, the main thing is that, you know, look, look into competition. When the market crashed, everybody was looking how to save money. Most people that came up with this concept probably didn't think about, you know, helping the environment. They were just trying to save cash. Uh, that's, that's the reality. And um, what happened is that, you know, over the downturn, the companies that started investing money in this type of solution, some, some of them run out of cash, and they stop putting money on new development. So because oceaneering is core business is ROV, as, so, as well as vessel work, we want to be in the front. So what we did, we keep spending money. So today, we're the only ones that have, you know, this technology working for an operator, generating value for the operator, and also getting paid for it. Uh, so after we deployed the system, you know, about a month ago in, uh, in the North Sea, I feel we're really like a few steps ahead of our competition. And as far as what the next technology, you know, we already have that uh, vehicle fully developed. So that robot is, exists today. And it's going to start a qualification here in Europe in about uh, two months. And that qualification lasts a year. So in about a year, we should have the second system already commercial available. So we're talking with major operators to already design the charging station into their field layout. So whenever the technology is ready, uh, it can be deployed, probably in a couple of years' time. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Jos Leo, SBM. Thanks for, uh, for your presentation. Um, the experience on, on the North Sea, and you've, show, you've shown this uh, Equinor platform, uh, is that it's quite crowded uh, with all kinds of traffic. So, for instance, when we pre-install a mooring, uh, we also have mooring boys at, at the service, but we have an, uh, a vessel, a warning vessel in, in a neighborhood in order to prevent an impact from uh, fishing trawlers and what have you. So it seems to me that your, your boy system is quite vulnerable to any of those impacts. Uh, how do you tackle that? Yeah, we, uh, so there are a few benefits and there are also new hazards we bring in with this new technology, right? So this, there is one system operating offshore and we're learning quite a lot from it. What I'm thinking is that, you know, with the development of that technology within the next year or so, we should be able to mitigate risks related to, like, fishing or, you know, someone just going there and trying to, to play.
play with that buoy. So it's an evolving technology. Uh, what I'm really um, proud to say is that we're the first ones to get this done. Yeah, but it's a learning curve, right? Uh, we're at the beginning of the learning curve now. We went through the technology leap. Now is what we can learn from the operation of this thing and how to make it more efficient. Hello, Jeremy Weir from uh, Sub-C7, so very interesting uh, presentation. Um, you managed to remove the vessel, but you, you still need from time to time to change the, the system, the ROV. Have you considered going further and, I don't know, installing something using uh, renewable energy to, to reload the battery? Yeah, we've looked into that. You know, we, have a, we don't have that technology in-house. That's why we went this route. It was easier for us to just adapt uh, uh, batteries. But we've looked into you know, like wind power, we've seen what we've seen just now. Uh, also buoy generation energy. So there are a couple options there. The, the main difference is that you know, this type of work that's taking place today, the ROV technology is not very different than the ROV technology before. It was just you know, changing the interfaces, coming up with a vehicle that's more uh, electrical than you know, hydraulic mechanical type of function. But the, that vehicle still needs fairly regular maintenance. So you can't have that existing system in water for, you know, if, you're, if you're, uh, electricity uh, allowed, it could be there for probably 10 weeks, but it will require to be recovered for maintenance. Now the Freedom, which is the next generation of system, those, they're being designed to have like a, at least six months of uh, maintenance window. So this way it can stay in water you know, between six and eight months without having to, to take uh, any maintenance. So the maintenance part is what today doesn't allow us to leave this ROV leave, uh, subsea for like four months. Cool? All right. As some of the suppliers are going to AUV, this is a different approach. Mm -hmm. How you compare the advantage or disadvantage of uh, AUV against what you present? Yeah, when, uh, so we have AUVs in our fleet as well, uh, not as many as ROVs. And when we look into AUV technology, it was very mature. There was a lot we had learned from that you know, uh, space to integrate into the new vehicle that you will see the Freedom. The thing is that the AUV has lots of limitations. Today, you know, when an AUV goes in the water, it can only stay in the water for probably two days. It has to be recovered, and then people do a, da a data swap, and then they put new battery pack, put it back in the water. Also, the way the AUV is designed, it cannot just stay in place uh, for a long period of time. It pretty much just, it's just like a ship going through. Uh, what we've tried to do is to integrate ROV capabilities so you can see the way the thrusters are designed. If you're doing inspection similar to an AUV using this new technology and you find something, not necessarily you need to keep going and wait several weeks for someone to look to the data. You know, you can stay right there and hover and get pictures and you know, maybe you touch it with sensors and get more data. And as soon as it's back to the charging station within a couple hours, you're sure people are get, receiving the, the information. So the response time is much better. Uh, but we use a lot of AUV technology to make an ROV that can behave like an AUV at times. from Ocean Infinity. So just I have a quick question um, with regards to what exactly uh, you can install in this uh, ROV Freedom. Uh, can you also do the multi-beam thing and uh, is, is it possible to put such sensors as SAS for example, high SAS and uh, things like that? Yeah, all the technology that today gets incorporated into an uh, AUV can be incorporated into that system as well. So it is that system, you know, uh, I didn't show too much detail because of the time, but it's actually made of uh, three modulars so the, the, what you can do is like, just like Lego. So if you have more sensors on it, you can just you know, adapt another middle section with more sensors on it. Or if you need uh, more battery life because you know, the distance between charging stations is too long, you go ahead and put another module there. So the vehicle is just gonna look longer with the additional modules there. Uh, but yeah, anything you can install on an ROV or an AUV today can be incorporated into Freedom. You may just need to expand it with a, a mid sandwich section. Thank you. Thank you.